Abhi and thank you for all the other uh, Buddhist organizations which are also participating in this talk. So today is uh, January 17, right? <laughs> 2021. So we are already 20, uh, 17 days into the new year. So I think it's not too late to wish everybody Happy New Year and to hope that all of you have peace and happiness for the balance the remaining of the year. So I think 2020 has been a difficult year for many of us. Uh, we call it the COVID year. In fact, now there's a terminology. If previously you're familiar with the word uh, BC and uh, AD, so now BC instead of so before Christ, it means before COVID, right? So BC is before COVID now. <laughs> so 2020 year of COVID, right? So even look back actually in another, what, eight days? It will be exactly one year when the first case of COVID-19 was detected in Malaysia. And uh, it was traced to three Chinese nationals who previously had close contact with an infected person in Singapore. So I think you all know, some of you may remember, they came to Jawbaru by Singapore on 24th January. And then on 25th January, we had the first case of COVID. So since then, Malaysia, we have had the, uh, what? I don't know, I, I've lost track. I think yes, as of yesterday, about 586, 587 people have died. And we have a total of more than 150,000 cases of COVID. So it has been a difficult year for, for many of us. Of course, globally, we also read that 94 million people have got COVID and 2 million have died. So a lot of uh, sorrow there, okay? Now, yet, if we look at our, our, our lives, we all aspire for happiness. Isn't it? In, in fact, it's interesting when, when I was asked to give this talk, uh, two days ago, uh, there was this report from the Global Happiness Survey by Ipsos. I think some of you know about Ipsos, a French multinational market research company. They came up with this Global Happiness Survey 2020. You, you can read, read this in the, on the in internet anyway, where they actually did a survey of 29 potential sources of happiness measured uh, among people around the world uh, that most likely to receive great happiness. And what is interesting is when I read this, it says that, uh, well, they've identified five as the key factors that leads to happiness. And the first one is health, which is like more than 55%. Relationships, which are like with friends, which is about 49 to 50%. Uh, of, of, Feeling life has got meaning. In other words, there's a meaning in, in, in our lives, which is 48%. Living conditions, and this is where you, you talk about, you know, being able to practice qualities like patience, contentment. So this contributes another 45%. And the last one is interesting, children. Having children is also one of the sources of happiness. There's about 49%. And in this global survey, Malaysia ranked 15. So we're not, we not too bad, yeah? But what I find really interesting in this uh, Global Happiness Survey 2020, which was released by Ipsos, is that out of the five main potential sources of happiness, uh, four of them are actually what I'm, I would like to share with you this morning from Dhammapada verse 204, which is about health, which is about relationships, about having meaning in life, and about how we live our lives in terms of practice of qualities like patience, contentment. Well, the Buddha talked to us about the importance of these qualities 2,600 years ago, way, way long ago before Ipsos was found. All right? So Ipsos survey basically uh, validated you know, what the Buddha has said. Okay? So today's talk is about happiness, which is a core aspect of the Buddha's teachings. I think more, perhaps more than any other religion, Buddhism is associated with happiness. In fact, if you look at Buddhist thinking, we said happiness and sorrow are actually our own responsibility. And they're actually completely within our control. Uh, there's a Buddhist saying that if we train our mind properly, happiness will be the result. And today, with the uh, dawn of positive psychology, people like Martin Seligman, people like uh, Richard Davidson, and neuroscience, which talks about neuroplasticity, then we know. And in fact, we begin to appreciate what the Buddha says actually is possible. Yeah. Okay, so let's see 
what are some of the things that the Buddha has been had said uh, 2,600 years ago, which is in, encapsulated in the Dhammapada. But before that, let me show you one slide here about happiness. Uh, this is a book that was written way back in 1998, which actually became a New York Times bestseller. Some of you may or may not have read or heard of this book. It, it's called The Art of Happiness. Yeah, so The Art of Happiness and uh, it says that I believe that the, that is what His Holiness the Dalai Lama says. Yeah? I believe that the very purpose of our life is to seek happiness. That is clear. Whether one believe in religion or not, whether one believe in this religion or that religion, we are all seeking something better in life. So I think the very motion of our life is towards happiness. Okay. So this is a wonderful book. I read it, and uh, it has also. Uh, brought a lot of happiness right, in my life and, uh, and I was able to share some of this happiness because this happiness is... So I thought since we're talking about happiness, I'd just like to introduce to you this book. All right? And if you find this book useful, subsequently His Holiness wrote another book called The Art of Happiness uh, at Work. All right? So it's, it's a kind of a series. Okay. But today we're, we're not going to talk about that. Today we're going to go back to uh, the Buddha's uh, teachings which is found in the uh, in, the, in the Dhammapada, okay? So this is called uh, Supreme Happiness in Dhammapada verse 204, where the Buddha talks about good health is the greatest gain, contentment is the greatest wealth, a trusted friend is the best relative, and Nibbana is the highest bliss. So as I mentioned just now in the Global Happiness Survey, the first, uh, the top five of the thing that really bring happiness are actually health, which is what in Dhammapada verse 204 is the first, uh, first point mentioned by the Buddha. Uh, contentment, which is the greatest wealth. This is item number four in the Ipsos Global Happiness Survey about living conditions, all right, about contentment, about patience. And then the trusted friend about friendship, which is who is the best relative in the Ipsos Global Happiness Survey. This is about relationships, our relationship with friends, with partners, our spouse, our families. So relationships are very important. And finally, Nibbana is the highest bliss. And if you are a Buddhist, if you are someone who is trying to embark on the Buddhist path, what is our meaning in life? What is our purpose in life? It is to understand what is Nibbana. And here in the Dhammapada 204, it says Nibbana is the highest happiness. Nibbana paramang sukang, as it is said in Pali. So Nibbana is the highest happiness. And Nibbana is what it gives us meaning in life. So we're going we're gonna to touch a little bit on this topic of Nibbana. We, we're not going to give a talk on Nibbana, but we're going to understand how we can understand Nibbana as the highest bliss. So what is interesting, as I say, if you correlate this to something very contemporary, something that was released to the world just like two days ago in the Global Happiness Survey 2020, you find that all these four things which the Buddha mentioned in the Dhammapada is exactly what the Global Happiness Survey is talking, of, is talking about. And we've been fortunate enough to have come in contact with the Dhamma. So let us not waste this golden opportunity to understand more the Buddha's teachings because that is what is going to give us happiness. Okay, so let's start with looking at the first one which is called good health is the greatest gain. Now, the next couple of slides, uh, you will appreciate that the Buddha was not always talking about abstruse or highly complex stuff, like uh, how many thought moments make one thought process, you know, or, you know, he, he talked something really down to earth, some things that, uh, that makes people realize that, uh, that what he taught actually brings happiness to them. So let's look at some of this slide, how the Buddha was a very down to earth, he talks about the fundamental aspects of what makes, makes people happy. Holistic health. I've just used this word, holistic health. So some background. So like old age and death, sickness is part of life. As many of you who are familiar with the Buddhist scriptures, you have heard of the Upajatana Sutta, where the Buddha talks about five things we should contemplate on a daily basis. Birth, old age, sickness, and death among them. So old age and death, sickness is part of life. The moment you are born, you, go, you grow old. If you grow old, the chances of you being sick is always there. And with sickness, eventually we die. 
So birth, old age, sickness, and death. They are part and parcel of life. But that doesn't mean that if you are sick, we don't do anything about that. All right? We can cure sickness by taking medicine. Uh, but, if it, but if sickness continues to remain, despite all the effort that we have made, it should be accepted and mindfully endured. Our illness, actually, if you look at it from a different perspective, can help us to cultivate healthy mental states. Example, when we are sick, instead of asking, why me? We learn to understand, to practice the importance of patience. We begin to understand that sickness is part and parcel of life. We try to cure our sickness. If we get well, that's great. Despite all our efforts, our sickness remains. So we turn our mind by looking at illness and, and see how this illness can help us to cultivate a positive mental states. Why? Because the, in the Buddhist thinking, the body and mind are interrelated and interdependent. It is said the healthy body allows us to cultivate a healthy mind through meditation, which eventually leads to holistic good health. Okay? But if we are not well, if we are physically not well, we should also not allow our mind not to be not well. In fact, there's a, there's a teaching, uh, this is in the Nakula Pita Sutta, which is in the Sangyutta Nikaya 22.1. You, you, you can read the discourse. It's actually a discourse the Buddha gave to this householder called Nakula Pita, all right, where the Buddha said, Householder, you should know, when the body is suffering from disease, you should constantly train so that the mind does not suffer from disease. So this is where we have the popular saying, when the body is sick, make sure your mind is not sick. So again, you know, uh, today with, uh, modern, with, with modern psychology, modern, modern medicine, we know how important uh, the, the, the mind is in, in, in terms of preventing uh, physical sickness. All right? And many cases of people who suffer from cancer actually uh, you're able to trace it back because of uh, certain, tra certain trauma or, or certain um, mental stress that these people have, okay? So the mind is very important. So when our body is sick, make sure that the mind is not sick, okay? So the mind is very important in this case. So here the Buddha is talking about the importance of the mind. So for us to be healthy, we have to take care of our mind, not just our body, okay? Now, this is where if we take care of our mind, we actually reoriented our mind to uh, develop what is called a positive attitude. I just want to, to throw you uh, an, an, an article which was uh, uh, published not too long ago in April 2019. You can read this. It's in the BBC uh, Science Focus magazine. It's called Science Focus, written by Andy Ridgway, where he was quoting uh, a 2003 study where over 300 volunteers in the US were knowingly infected with a virus. Uh, well, at the time it wasn't COVID, yeah? it was the, the common cold, right? Infected with a virus responsible for the common cold. They were then monitored for symptoms over the next five days. The results were clear. Those with the most positive outlooks on life were three times less likely to develop cold symptoms than those who were the least happy. So other studies have reached similar conclusions. So developing a positive attitude is crucial. All right, so this is what in the earlier slide, you know, talking about the importance of the mind. So when, so if, 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 uh, if our mind is, is strong, all right, then we, we can even, you know, uh, as this research have shown, be able to even prevent certain illnesses from arising, okay? And some, and some illnesses are actually what we call psychosomatic. So they arise because of our mind. So here, Buddhism is one, one, one religion or one teaching which emphasizes the importance of the mind. Now, something else about health, all right, uh, besides the mind, of course, our, our body. You see, the Buddha also emphasized the importance of taking care of our body, not just our mind. As I said in my first slide, is the mind and body. So it's not just the mind itself. Well, the mind is very important, but we should also take care of the body. And one way is, for example, the food that we take. Now, this is an interesting discourse in the Dona Paka Sutta. Again, you can read this. Uh, you know, uh, so where King Pasenadi, some of you know, 
Chimpanzee Nadi. We've been following uh, Buddhist, uh, Buddhist history. There are two very popular or famous kings during the Buddha's time. One is King Pasenadi of uh, Kosala, and the other one is King Bimbisara. All right. Now, this is King Pasenadi, who once ate a bucket full of food. All right. I think uh, some other translations say he ate a tub full of food, which basically means it's a lot of food. He overate. All right. He overate. And he was panting. He was too tired. He ate too much. All right. So he went to see the Buddha. And discerning that the king had overeaten and had discomfort. All right, the Buddha uttered this verse. So the Buddha was able to relate directly with the discomfort of the Buddha. And what did the Buddha say to King Pasinadi in the Donapaka Sutta? You can read this. Yeah, He says, when a person is constantly mindful and knows when enough food has been taken, all their afflictions become more slender. They age gradually, protecting their lives. So you see, there's a play of words. Uh, when a person is constantly mindful, so when, when you are eating, it's good to be mindful. Yeah, it's good to be mindful not to eat too much. I think the, uh, well, uh, who was that? Uh, the, the, Tun Mahathir used, 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 was once asked what was the secret for his uh, longevity and his good health. And he says that uh, he, you know, he, he would only eat like uh, 85% or, or 90% or, or 80% of. Of, of what is given to him, you know, and, and not the, the whole thing, right? So we have to be mindful, uh, knows when is enough food has been taken, okay? So don't be too greedy. And, you know, this is something very fundamental, very basic, and yet the Buddha used this occasion to explain to King Pasenadi. And he said, all your afflictions become more slender. You know, uh, the, if you read the commentaries about King Pasenadi, he is depicted as someone who is very fat, you know, maybe obese, you know? So he's, as a result, when he walks, he's very slow and, and he's always easily tired because he's so fat, so, 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 so obese. So here he says, if you are mindful in what you eat, how much food that you eat, all your afflictions become even more slender. And likewise, you become slender. <laughs> so it's a play of, of word there with King Pasenadi. And you age gradually, you see. So the, the Buddha even uh, implied that, you know, you want to, we all age, yeah, but let's age gradually. Let's not look older than, 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 than our age, as we say today, right? Isn't it? So, so how do we age gradually? By taking care of our health. By not, by ensuring that we don't overeat, for example. And in that way, we also protect our life. So you see some very simple, very basic teachings that the Buddha gave. All right, so nothing obstruse, nothing complex, nothing that's uh, mind boggling, all right? Something very simple, very basic, you can say. Now, likewise, you see, the Buddha gave advice to the, to the monks, yeah? What did the Buddha tell the monk? All right, and you can find this in the Kitagiri Sutta, Majjhima Nikaya 70, okay? Um, the Buddha once addressed the monks, and this is what he told the monks. I, monks, do not eat a meal in the evening. Not eating a meal in the evening, I, monks, am aware of good health and, be, and, being, and of being without illness and buoyancy and strength and living in comfort. Yeah? Come, do you too, monks, not eat a meal in the evening. Not eating a meal in the evening, you too, monks, will be aware of good health and living in comfort. So again, the Buddha is giving some very practical, very down to us advice or rational why the monks, they just need to eat one meal a day. And I think till to today, uh, all monks in the Theravada tradition practice this. And, and I know even some in the Mahayana traditions, even though they're vegetarians, some of them also uh, ob observe this one solid meal a day. Right? So there's some, there's, so there's, there's a lot of truth in what the, the Buddha says, all right, about having uh, moderate food. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I remember there was this slide. So, so the people in Okinawa have a few things in common. They eat only until the stomachs are about 80%. Their meals include plenty of fruits, vegetables, and antioxidants. They eat all colors of the rainbow in their diet. Well, modern... Modern nutritionist tells you that you know the, the you should eat the vegetables. They are very colorful ones, 
uh, your purple cauliflowers or your purple cabbage because you know they 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 are, they are, they are good lots of antioxidants they have a uh, unharried lifestyle and spend more time in community activities that build happy and strong relations okay so mahatya could pro probably have have, have, got, have learned this from the okinawans now meditation again as uh, today's talk we will not talk of, go into details about meditation but i think all of you know about the importance in Buddhist practice and research today has shown that practicing meditation regularly and being more mindful, i.e. focus on the present moment has beneficial effects for a range of conditions. So this includes stress, anxiety, depression, poor sleep and coping with chronic pain. It also has other health benefits like reduce inflammation, improve immunity and lower blood pressure. And I think a, a lot of research has gone to it. So you could easily assess this information, starting from people like John Kabat-Zinn, all right? I'm sure you have heard of John Kabat-Zinn and his uh, MBSR, Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction Techniques, right? How he was able to apply mindfulness meditation uh, to improve the health of his patients at the University of Massachusetts uh, Medical School. And subsequent to that, we find uh, Richard, Robbins, uh, Richard Robinson, and His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and people like Daniel Goldman. So they have had uh, very regular, uh, almost like annual conferences that, uh, that, that looks in, into relationships between uh, Buddhist teachings on meditation and, and, and neuroscience, how meditation can actually improve health. Okay? And, and again, what is interesting is that all these things the Buddha has talked about 2,600 years ago, and it is only as recent as what, like maybe 30 years, that, uh, that modern neuroscience is, uh, is beginning to, to, to appreciate the benefits of meditation. Okay, but uh, we, for today's talk, I will not go, go into some of this. So, that, so that's the, the, the first part about the, our health. So here in the, in the verse 204, the Buddha talks the importance of health. So what is important is we're, we're looking at not just our mental health, but also our physical health. So both are absolutely important, okay? That is why like, like, like meditation, we not only have sitting meditation, I'm sure you, you, you know, we have four postures. We also do standing and we do a lot of walking meditation. So that also helps to, uh, you know, to, to improve blood, uh, blood circulation, right? So, because you, you don't want to sit for, for two, three, four, five hours and, and then you, you end up having VDT, right? Okay. So the second one is on contentment, all right, contentment. So this is, uh, now what is contentment? In the verse 204, the Buddha talks about contentment. So what is contentment here? So contentment, uh, the Buddha says contentment is the greatest wealth. So what does it mean by that? So this is a feeling when you are happy with who you are and what you have. Example, the material acquisition that you own. That is why the Buddha says contentment is the greatest wealth. The money, our, our properties, our wealth, is there such thing as we have had enough? You can, you can never have enough of, of your wealth. You can, have, you can never have enough of whatever property that you have. All right? So how do we have, con how do we have con contentment? It is by creating a mental attitude. So if we develop a mental attitude, that realizes external things, yes, external things can make us happy and content, but only for a while. Why? Number one, because material things are by its nature impermanent. They are, they are, they are, never, uh, they are never the same, all right? You think back of, of, of the time when you first started working. Maybe when you first started working, your salary was, uh, I don't know, depending when you, when you start working. Bobby mentioned that he knew me more than 30, 40 years ago. So, so when I started working those days, uh, you'd be very happy if you earn something like uh, 1,200, 300 ringgit. And that's what I earned at that time. So I was happy. And I told myself, if I can earn 2,000, I'll be very happy. But when I earned 2,000, I realized that, look, my needs, have, my, my needs, and my ones have all changed. 2,000 ringgit is no longer enough. I want more and more and more. So, so when do we stop saying that, yes, I've had enough? So it's a mental attitude. 
that realizes external things. Yes, external things, they do make us happy. Money, yes, they make us happy. Properties make us happy. Good friends make us happy. Yeah, they all do make us happy. No question about it. But only for a while because they all change. Nothing stays static. Everything changes. And they can never completely quench our insatiable craving for more power and possessions. So the ability to let go will give us contentment. All right? So you must not be like, like some, some presidents, you know, who were every, were everywhere from the Supreme Court right down to pollsters have said that you have lost the election, but you still refuse to accept that you have lost the election. Right? So you still cling on to that, that nope, I got, uh, got 10, 10, 10, 10 over million people who voted for me, phantom voters. Yeah? So how do we have that attitude that we will realize that while external things make us happy and content, but they are only momentary, so that we really appreciate that contentment is the greatest wealth. And there are a couple of things in the, in the teachings, and one of the attitudes that we develop is called gratitude. In Pali, it's kata anyu, kata anyu, to, to develop this attitude of gratitude. So if we learn to develop this attitude of gratitude, then we will be able to cultivate contentment. And these are some, some examples here. Be thankful for what you have, not what you lack. All right? If you keep on telling yourself, oh, how I wish I had that, how I wish I had this, but you forgot what you already have. All right? So please reflect what you already have and not what you lack. Okay? Be thankful you don't need to go hungry. I think all, the, all of you who are able to attend to this talk means that you don't need to go hungry. Because if you, if you uh, have to look for your next meal, I don't think you'll be able to, 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 to come, sit down, listen to this talk. You, you, you'll be busy trying to you know, go out and, and, and you know, maybe look for your next meal. So be thankful you don't need to go hungry. Right? You may not have the best meal, all right, now with, uh, with, uh, with COVID-19, you, you, you can't go and eat in your best restaurants. Uh, so, so, but you still don't need to go hungry, all right? And be thankful for the friends that you have, all right? The next slide, we're going to talk about friendship in Buddhism. So be thankful for the friends that you have, okay? And, um, well, when we come to the topic on friends, we will discuss a little bit more about that. The next one is be thankful you have a home to sleep. Again, I think all of us here, especially in Malaysia, all right, we are all very fortunate. We have a home to sleep. While many of us may not be happy with the, well, with the state our country is in, whether it's the political aspects or the economic aspect, all right, but we can still be thankful that we have a home to come back to. You know, you know before... COVID-19 or BC, right? Before COVID, you know, I used to spend practically more than half my life uh, traveling different parts of the world. And while I enjoy, you know, those days, but somehow coming back home always have got a special feeling. I always feel thankful that, hey, I'm home. All right, I'm, 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 I'm home, you know? So there's nothing uh, beats a home that, that you have, all right? So, well, the whole of last year, since, since, uh, since March, I've not been traveling, but I'm still thankful that, well, I still have a home, okay? All right. And finally, thankful that you are breathing. Thankful that you are breathing, okay? What happens when you don't breathe? <laughs> You'll be dead, all right? That is why uh, in Buddhist meditation, of course, there are different techniques. Some you meditate uh, through sound, some you meditate, you know, different, different methods, but one of the most popular methods is true to do breathing meditation. Why do we breathe? Sometimes we take for granted that we breathe. Don't you think so? We actually take for granted that we, that we are breathing because if you don't breathe, all right, you're dead. That is why in meditation, you're taught breathing in, breathing out. Can you imagine you breathe in, but you don't breathe out? <laughs> okay, so, so that is important. So we can be thankful for many things. So that is when we cultivate all right, a very powerful and important quality which helps us to develop contentment, okay? So try this. 
So after today's talk, right, if you feel that you, you feel, oh, you know, why I lack this, why I lack that, you know, okay. Before you continue the next, uh, the, the, the next step, ask yourself, do you have what you, what you need? All right. If you have, be thankful what, what you have, not what you lack. Okay. Right. So contentment, that is why the Buddha say contentment is the greatest wealth. On contentment, again, modern science, you see, what the Buddha talked to us 2,600 years ago, today, we are very fortunate that increasingly, especially scientists, right, they are, they are coming up with, with uh, research and, um, you know, and books that actually corroborates or validates what the Buddha said. Now, this is just an example. This book is called Hard Wiring Happiness, Rick Hansen. Now, Rick Hansen uh, wrote this book, uh, uh, um, some years back, okay, so uh, 2009, sorry, 2009, he's, he's also the author of the book called The Buddha's Brain, all right, interesting book, The Buddha's Brain. So Rick Hansen is a neurologist and senior fellow at the UC Berkeley, a New York Times bestselling author. So he, he considers himself a Buddhist. He lays out a very simple method that uses positive psychology of everyday experiences to build new neural structures full of love, contentment, and gratitude to develop happiness in our lives. Okay? As, as Buddhists, I think we are all familiar with what the Buddha talk about in the Brahma Vihara Sutta, the four Brahma Viharas. So here, um, uh, Rick Hansen also talks about Brahma Viharas. If you read this book, Heart Wiring Happiness, but he also talks about the importance of contentment and gratitude to develop happiness in our lives. So increasingly, you, you'll find that there are, there are um, uh, research being done that uh, validates many of the Buddha's teachings. Okay? So again, I just uh, introduced this, this book to you. Hope, hope that you will, uh, at some stage, uh, get your hands on it and, and then read it. I think it's a very good book. It, it helps to uh, further inspire you that what you have been listening in Dhamma Talks that they are actually been, been proven true uh, by modern science. Right? So I, I think that will further inspire you and build up that faith and confidence in the teachings of the Buddha. Okay? So I recommend you this book called Heart Wiring Happiness. You, you can get it easily on, on Amazon. Or you could write to Rick Hansen. He has got a website where he, he actually en, en, encouraged people to write to him. And he's an interesting guy. Right, the third one is on friendship. Now, what did the Buddha say is about friendship? Uh, in, the, in the Dhammapada, uh, verse 204, the Buddha says, trusted friend is the best relative. So in others, about friendship. I think I put in that Pali word here is called Kalyana Mitta, or in Sanskrit is Kalyana Mitra. So in Sanskrit, the word Mitta is Mitra, M-I-T-R-A. So it means the same thing. And uh, many of you are familiar with this, uh, this, uh, this, this saying here from the Upada Sutta. Upada Sutta is again found in the Samyutta Nikaya, where there was this dialogue between Venerable Ananda and the Buddha. Some of you have heard about it, but I thought I'd, I'd just repeat this for those who have not. So they say that Ananda, one of the, uh, one of the, the Buddha's uh, disciples, also his cousin, Ananda once went to the Buddha and made this statement. And this is what Ananda says. This is half of the holy life, Lord. Admirable friendship, admirable companionship, admirable camaraderie. Now, when the Buddha heard this, what did the Buddha say? <laughs> All right. The Buddha said, don't say that, Ananda. Admirable friendship, companionship, camaraderie is actually the whole of the holy life. Ananda was saying it's half of the holy life. But the Buddha says, no, friendship is the whole of the holy life. So when a monk has admirable people as friends, companions, and comrades, he can be expected to develop and pursue the Eightfold Path. Okay? So in the Upada Sutta, the Buddha corrected Ananda by telling him that friendship is not half the holy life. So friendship is the entire of the holy life. Okay? So bear that in mind, how important is friendship. But the concept of friendship is not only among monks even among lay people, all right? 
For example, uh, many of you also have heard of this famous discourse called the Sigalovada Sutta in the Book of Long Saying, Sutta 31. In the Sigalovada Sutta, which was a discourse the Buddha gave to this young man by the name of Sigala, the Buddha talks about true friends. It's, it's a fairly long discourse. I've just extracted one part of it. Yeah? So please read this, this long discourse. It's very good uh, discourse for lay people. He says that true friends, true friends have got four characteristics, all right? They protect you and your property at all times. They're always there for you despite thick or teens. They restrain you from bad action and encourage good action. They praise your good deeds and refrains others from speaking ill of you, okay? So again, because of time factor, I'm not going to go into details, but I just want to emphasize to you the importance that the Buddha plays on friendship, not just within the Sangha itself, among the monks or between the monks, but also with lay people. So that is why I specifically mentioned the name of this discourse so that after this talk, you could uh, Google this discourse and then uh, read it. And then you find that in this discourse, the Buddha talks about who are your true friends? Who are your false friends? So be very careful who are your true friends and who are your false friends. And my hope is that having read this discourse after this, you will not only look for true friends, you yourself will also become a true friend to others. Okay? I think many times we always think, oh, you know, the Buddha says we must look for the wise persons, like in the Mangala Sutta, associate with the wise, do not associate with the foolish, right? In the Mangala Sutta, one of the blessings. And then in the Sigalavada Sutta, the Buddha says, look for true friends, not false friends. I think we forget sometimes that while we try to look for true friends, we ask our, have we asked ourselves, did we become true friends to others? Okay, so that was something which, I, which came to my mind uh, when I listened to this teaching by Venerable Tukten Children. So she was talk, talking about true friends and, in, and throughout the whole talk, she was actually emphasizing the importance of we ourselves becoming a true friend to another person, not just looking for true friends. Okay, so I, I hope all of us while we realize who are our true friends, who are our false friends, we also become a true friend to others. We become a true Kalyana Mitta. Uh, those of you who are familiar with Tibetan Buddhism, you have heard of this word called Geishi, right? Geishi, you know, like, uh, you know, if your teacher is a, is a Geishi, you call Geishi La, Geishi La, right? So Geishi, the word Geishi actually comes from the, the Sanskrit word or Pali word Kalyana Mitta. You know, so that, that means a, a good friend, a spiritual friend, someone who is there, who has got these qualities of a good friend so that he can go and, uh, and, and help other people. All right. So let us be a good friend, a true friend to others besides only looking for other good friends. Right? And that will give us happiness. Okay? So that is why the, the Buddha says a trusted friend is the best relative. Now, there's another discourse. In fact, there are, more, there are more than what I've mentioned in today's talk, but I thought I'd just highlight this. So after you have read the Sigalovada Sutta, I hope you will also Google this Dikajanu Sutta, which is in the book of, uh, book of uh, Anu, uh, Gradual Sayings, Sutta, uh, Book of Eight, Sutta 54, where the Buddha talks about eight things, uh, eight things that are good for, uh, for happiness, for four things that will con are conducive for worldly happiness and four things for spiritual happiness. And one of the things that is conducive for worldly happiness is good friendship. So again, here the Buddha talks about a lay person spends time with those who advance in virtue. He talks with them and engages them in discussions. He emulates those who are skilled in faith, in virtues, in generosity, in wisdom. So basically what, what this sutta is saying is that, or Dikajanu sutta is a, uh, is that you look for a friend who have got faith, who have got faith in the Buddha Dhamma, for example, who have faith in, in virtues, maybe in sila, who are generous by nature and who have got wisdom. So when you search or when you associate with people who have these good qualities, you yourself must ask, do I have these qualities? Do I also cultivate faith? Do I cultivate virtues? Do I cultivate generosity? Do I cultivate wisdom? Okay, so as I mentioned early on, friendship does not only mean 
people who relate to you, but how you relate to other people. Again, this is a wonderful this discourse. This is a discourse the Buddha gave to another lay person. All right. Uh, this, his name is, uh, well, we don't really know what his name. Dika Janu is not his name. Dika Janu basically means uh, he has got long knee. Dika means long. Janu means he got long legs. So this must be a very tall person, right? <laughs> so Dika Janu, that means uh, Buddha's teaching to Dika Janu. Sometimes it's translated as Vagya Pacha. So admirable friendship. Now, again, you know, I thought I just introduced to you what contemporary research have said about friendship. Now, there's this book, which is a very new book. Uh, I've read the review of this book. I've not read the book in, in, in full. I've only read the review. But having read the review, it has been very positive. And, and I've also read the background of the author. And I think it's a book is worth uh, worth researching, worth reading through. All right? It came out only as recently as last year. Okay? Now, this is a new research by Lydia Danforth uh, from Princeton University, so who shows how crucial friendship is not only for happiness and emotional well-being, but physical health too. All right? So this is a summary of what this book says. Uh, scientists in brain and genetics research discovers that friendship is reflected in our brain waves our genomes, right, and our cardiovascular and immune systems. So if, if, if you uh, display qualities of friendship toward others and you have got good friends who can relate to you, it makes you very happy, all right? And with happiness, it will also contribute to not just uh, emotional well-being and happiness, but also physical health. So as you can see, when the Buddha gave this talk on the, or we gave this teaching on, on uh, Dhammapada 204, you can see that actually contentment, uh, friendship, they're actually all related also in some ways to good health. And again, you, today with modern science, modern medicine, more and more research are coming up to, to validate what the, what the Buddha has been saying for over 2,600 years ago, okay? I'm not saying that we need all this research to validate what the Buddha is saying. I'm not saying that, yeah? I'm just saying that uh, uh, when we study and practice the Buddha's teachings, and when we read all this research, it gives us, it, it gives a smile to our face, right? It, it, it gives us a smile in, in the sense that, yeah, the Buddha was right all this while, okay? The Buddha was right all this while. That was why, you know, if you remember His Holiness, the Dalai Lama was once asked, he said, he was once asked by scientists, he said, you know, now you are going deeper and deeper in, into this dialogue, this discussion between Buddhism and science. What happens if one day science were to disprove that uh, what the Buddha said is, is not true? His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, smiled and he said, well, if science can disprove that, that's fine. Then we will not, not accept that. But so far, the more you find that science or psychology have, have gone into, and it further just, just uh, create this con the conclusion that what the Buddha says actually is very much in line with the modern research. Right? So as I said, we don't need science to confirm what the Buddha has taught, all right? but if, if, it, if it proves that what the Buddha has taught is right, why not? It, it, makes, it, it makes us happier. Right? And to, to know that you know what that the Buddha was right all this while, okay. So it's opposite. It's opposite according to this book here. Friendship is that loneliness can kill. Now, of course, in, in Buddhism, uh, there's there's also another teaching which talks about how to be alone without being lonely. Right? So there's a big difference between uh, between being alone and being lonely. Okay. All right. Again, we don't have time to go into that. So that's on the science of friendship. Now, finally, because of time, I'm going to talk about Nibbana. Now, Nibbana, I'm sure many of you must have attended many Dhamma talks. Many great masters must have said, look, Nibbana is not to be talked about. <laughs> and I, I totally agree with, with that. But because uh, Nibbana Paramang Sukang is the fourth of the four aspects of happiness that the Buddha mentioned in the Dhammapada. So I thought I will... Uh, you know, say a little bit about this, but not too much, okay? Anyway, in the, 
if you, uh, it may not necessarily be true that we cannot talk about Nibbana. Um, I've got this book called Achan, uh, called The Island. I've got two books here, actually. It's called The Island. It's an anthology of the Buddha's teachings on Nibbana. I've, I, I've just started uh, reading, reading through The Island. Uh, it's also available on podcasts. So you can actually uh, listen to it on, on, on podcasts. So it's, a, it's, an, it's an excellent uh, readings uh, you can do and where Achan Pasano and Achan Amaro talks about it. But if you find this book a bit too heavy, then you can listen to a talk by Achan Amaro, uh, which is easily available on the internet. It is called Why We Need to Talk About Nibbana. <laughs> it's an interesting book. As you know, Achan Amaro is the head of the forest sankha in Amaravati. So he has a talk on, on, the, on Facebook and as, as also on the internet called Why We Need to Talk About Nibbana. All right, that's interesting. But there's another book called Nibbana for Everyone. This is by Achan Buddha Dasa. This is a little book. Uh, maybe you should start with this book. It's a little book uh, which was published by Nalanda for free distribution. Okay. And uh, let's see what, what, what does this, this say about Nibbana. This is Achan Buddha Dasa, right? great master who has passed away. Now he defined Nibbana as coolness. It is the coolness remaining when the defilements, greed, anger, fear, delusion have ended. Wherever there is freedom from defilement, there is the value and meaning of Nibbana. This coolness of heart and peace of mind that everyone desires is the meaning of Nibbana. And this is what gives, gives meaning or gives a meaning of life to Buddhists. All right? Now, what is important is, is what Achan Buddha Dasa says here. Nibbana is nothing in the least to do with death. Many people, even Buddhists, have this idea that, oh, you know, after I die, I attain Nibbana. But Achan Buddha Dasa says in this little book that Nibbana has nothing to do, at, in the least to do with death. The Buddha, uh, the word Nibbana means coolness. Back when it was just an ordinary word that people use in their homes, it also meant coolness. So what in, when it is used as Dhamma language in a religious context, it just means coolness, but refers to the cooling or going out of the fires or defilements. While in the common person's usage, it means the cooling of physical fire. So what basically for all of us here as ordinary Buddhists is that when we think of Nibbana, when we are not experiencing greed, when we are not experiencing hatred, when we are not experiencing delusion, in that small moments, all right, we are experiencing Nibbana. But those small moments doesn't last. Those small moments, they come and then they go. All right? So it is those moments, it is when we practice mindfulness, when we try to live in the, be in the present, when we realize that uh, when anger arises, when we recognize we are aware of our anger, then our anger drops away. Then in that moment, we feel cool. When you are very angry, it's like you have fire all over you. But when you're not angry, when you're cool. So that's the meaning of Nibbana. All right. Um, Jack Confield, you know, a well-known meditation uh, vipassana teacher, he says, that let, us, let us have these small moments of Nibbana, right? Small moments, right? And eventually, and we con continue to cultivate less greed, less hatred, less delusion, but more kindness, more generosity, more compassion, qualities of coolness. Then we have more experiences of, of Nibbana. So we can see Nibbana in that sense. So that's why in, in this book on page three, Achim Buddha Dasa says, Nibbana has nothing to do with death. All right? So don't think that, oh, I, I cannot experience Nibbana now. I've got to wait till I'm dead. So Buddhism is for the living, not, not for the dead. Right? It's for the living. And, and Nibbana, if you see Nibbana in that context, all right, is coolness, something that is not so far away that we say, oh, it's something that we cannot attain. All right. If we can learn to get rid of our defilements of greed, or we can reduce our defilements of greed, hatred, and delusion, when we are able to experience a state of happiness, that state of happiness is Nibbana. All right? But it is, not, uh, it is temporary. It, it, it doesn't stay. Okay? So, so that is why instead of making it just a mental state, we turn it into a trait. Uh, you know, the difference between mental states and a, men and, and a trait. 
a, a mental state rise and it, it goes away. Whereas if it is a trait, it stays with us. All right. So the word nibbana in that sense can be seen in that manner. Now, definition, this is Achan Amaro in, in his book called The Island. Uh, is a word that is used to describe an experience. So when the heart is free of all obscuration and is utterly in accord with nature, ultimate reality, it represents perfect peace, joy, and contentment. So when you have peace in your mind, when you're experiencing peace, when you're experiencing joy, when you're experiencing contentment, that moment, that is a state of Nibbana. Now, unfortunately for all of us, it doesn't stay. So the, 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 the challenge for all of us is how to make peace, joy, and contentment part and parcel of our life, part and parcel of our everyday mental uh, state of mind. So this set of qualities is what Nibbana describes. So mindfulness meditation, you know, is for example, is, is helping us to work towards that state of peace, joy, and contentment. Okay, so these are qualities what Nibbana describes. So Achan Amaro also says Nibbana is here and now. It is not an attainment in the future. So similar to what Achan Buddha Dasa says, it's not something that you wait till you die to attain. So the reality is here and now. It is so very simple, but beyond description. It can't be bestowed or even conveyed. It can only be known by each person for themselves. But it is a goal that gives meaning to a Buddhist in life. So those of you who, who are also familiar with Mahayana Buddhism, especially what is called human life Buddhism or humanistic Buddhism, the teachings that are propounded by great masters like Master Singyun, uh, Master Yingshun, and, and early on Master Taishu from China. Now they're talking about, and of course, Master uh, Dhammadram, Master Shengyan, about uh, creating heaven on earth, about, about creating peace and happiness in this very life itself, okay? So this is, this is how they look at it from a Mahayana perspective. So Nibbana is here and now, as Ajahn Amaro says in the book, in the island. It is not an attainment in the future. So you don't, you don't have to wait till and say, wait, you know, uh, I'm practicing for the future. No, I'm practicing for the here and now, all right? So you practice how to get rid of greed, of get rid of hatred, get rid of delusion, so that you experience that peace, that happiness, that contentment here and now. And when you get that little experience of that, that is called Nibbana. Okay? So you can't, so it is the goal that gives meaning to life. So if you have that as your meaning in, in life, then your life becomes meaningful. And, and, and you remember I at the start of my talk, and I mentioned that in the global happiness survey, the it says that the five aspects of uh, that makes people happy, and one of it is feeling that life has got meaning. So this is what Buddhism is all about. If you don't have, if you don't have Nibbana as your, as your end in mind, then you don't really have a meaning in life, so to speak, okay? And this is again, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> again, there's this, uh, this, this, this teaching here about meaning of life. Uh, this is from UC San Diego School of Medicine. Many think about the meaning and purpose in life from philosophical perspective, but meaning in life is associated with better health, wellness, and longevity. Those with meaning in life are happier and healthier than those without it. So when you find more meaning in life, you become more contented. If you are more contented, you become happier. If you don't, you feel much more distressed. If, imagine if you come to practice Buddhism and somebody says the goal is to attain Nibbana and, and, some, and somebody says, oh, you can only attain Nibbana only after you're dead. Then you, then you tell yourself, then, then why do I practice so hard now? You know, what, how, what, what happens when I'm dead? I do not know, but I know what happens now. All right, but both from, you listen from what Achan Buddha Dasa says, Nibbana here and now and Achan Amaro. So, so these, are, these are teachers which, which makes us understand that, yes, Nibbana is not something uh, hazy up there, but something that we can experience right, in this very life itself, here and now, when we are able to reduce or, and, and eventually get rid of our defilement. Okay? Or as, the, as we say today, when we're able to transform all our negative emotions into positive ones. Okay? So, I think that's the last slide. Uh, it's already 11, okay? 
So because there are four, four aspects here. So I hope you remember in the Dhammapada 204, the Buddha says good health is the greatest gain. Right? Remember the first one, good health. Secondly, contentment is the greatest wealth. All right? Thirdly, friendship is our best relative. And finally, Nibbana is the highest bliss. Nibbana is the highest happiness. Nibbana paramang sukhang. Right? So Nibbana is the highest happiness. So we have about 25 minutes. So if there, I'm sure there are some questions or comments. I'm, I'm happy to, to, to go through them. Thank you very much.